Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. And today he's going to be talking about a 800-page history book by Doris Kearns Goodwin, Team of Rivals. So here's Mr. Terramina again. Welcome. Thank that, you. Welcome sir. back. Thank I mean. you. Thanks very much. I uh, do appreciate the opportunity to do this kind of thing. I'm sort of an unretreaded social studies teacher who uh, always enjoyed uh, that part of my life where I could show up and have all the kids just sit there and listen to me for a while. Not that they did, but you know. <laughs> Uh, it's, I have to apologize to my grandson. He uh, reminded me of the fact that we took a ride recently to New York City, uh, to Long Island, and, and I reviewed this book for him on the way down. <laughs> so this is his uh, second experience with the team of rivals. This is the book, of course. Uh, Joe uh, has used several figures here. He said, you know, uh, 900 pages, 800 pages, it's actually around 750 pages with the additional uh, pages at the end are all notes. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, if you're a Civil War buff and you haven't read this book, uh, I would say you have to read it. My sense is that reading this book will provide you with information and with insights that you will very likely not get anywhere else. And I think that uh, we ought to celebrate the work that Doris Kearns uh, Goodwin did here and the patience that she must have displayed over 10 years of reading uh, what it, it seems to me was endless correspondence between William Henry Seward and his wife and between uh, Salma Chase and his daughter and she, her, her many, many, many references to letters that, of this sort where she, you know, she got the stuff that's in the book uh, gave me the vision of this woman sitting there was surrounded by bales of paper <laughs> going through them and, and, and reading them all. Uh, but she did a wonderful job of putting it all together. Secondly, as I embarked on this little enterprise, it occurs to me that it's useful to recognize that this book is not a novel. Novels, of course, are fiction, which means that the writer observes human behavior, a lot of different people under a lot of different circumstances, then creatively, using his or her imagination, produces a character to entertain, amuse, or inform the reader. This is history, real people doing real things, but I make the comparison with a novel because for me the book grabbed me like a novel. For instance, despite the fact that we all know how the story is going to turn out, when Doris Kearns Goodwin describes the people and the events leading to the election of Lincoln in 1864 or to the end of the war and the Union victory in 1865, she does it in a way which is so engaging it is difficult to put the book down, even though, as I said, you already know how it's going to turn out, which, of course, you don't with a novel. Uh, because of the great variety of sources she has access to, and she uses letters, diaries, newspaper reports, she weaves a tapestry which is so detailed and so filled with interesting factual information that she gives the reader the feeling that he or she gets to know the characters in the story better than he or she ever got to know them anywhere else, and they are not fictional characters, they are all real, so that really is quite uh, an engaging part of the book, at least it was for me. I came away from reading this book with a sense that I gained an understanding about this period of American history that I never really fully appreciated before uh, I, I went through the process of reading the book. What were these things? Well, first of all, uh, there's the idea that Lincoln had a point of view toward the history of the United States, toward humanity, and toward human society, which he was determined to use his time, energy, and talents to bring about. Lincoln never wavered in his understanding of the fundamental principle of the Declaration of Independence as it applied to human beings and to society, and in his determination to act as a political leader 
to preserve this principle for the country and indeed for all humanity. For him, the Union was the vehicle through which the sacred principle of self-government had to be preserved and applied. It had to be preserved because if it was not, human beings would lose their opportunity to live in a dignified and respectful manner. A dignified and respectful manner. This is a subject which could be discussed at great length, but I think it's, it is where you have to look to find out one of the wellsprings of Lincoln's behavior. Lincoln was always consistent in sticking to the idea that the founders of the United States had created a nation based on the Declaration of Independence, uh, and I, a copy of which I happen to have with me. <laughs> you, know, you can get anything off the net, right? Just, just go to the net and get it printed out. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's the language of the Declaration of Independence. And if I'm lucky, uh, when we, when, of course, one of Lincoln's, Lincoln, there's a book I read recently about uh, Lincoln's speeches uh, which includes all, you know, all the speeches he made. But the one that most of us probably remember, of course, is the Gettysburg Address. And, and when he begins the Gettysburg Address, how does he begin it? He says, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Uh, now, the, the notion of the, uh, of the preservation of the Union, I think, grows out of this idea that in order to preserve this principle, the Union has to be preserved. It's the only political vehicle that's going to do it. If the Union is not preserved, then the principle that we're talking about here is not going to be preserved. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the spread of slavery as a violation of this great principle, which if it was permitted would eventually lead to its violation by people in power uh, for any person who, who, uh, th this, who wished to violate it. Uh, and in, in the last Lincoln-Douglas debate, one of the references he made was, look, if you uh, want to, you know, if you decide that you're going to let slavery spread to the western part of North America, then what's going to happen eventually is that you're going to stand, get up one morning and say, well, let's see, we've done this for the blacks, we've enslaved the blacks, why don't we enslave, God forbid, the Italians? <laughs> or why don't we enslave the Poles? Or why don't we enslave the Jews? Or why don't we just pick out a set of racial or national characteristics and decide this is the group of people we're going to enslave? And what Lincoln is saying is the only way to prevent this is to preserve the Union and not to let slavery spread outside of the South. Now, secondly, Lincoln's words and his actions as they are assembled in this book reveal him as the consummate politician, the practitioner of the art of the possible. Now that's something that I think you ought to bear in mind when you read the book, the art of the possible. That's what politics is about, the art of the possible, particularly in a democracy like ours. How can you make it happen? This is best illustrated by Lincoln's reply to an editorial in the New York Tribune entitled The Prayer of Twenty Millions, in which Horace Greeley criticized Lincoln for not acting more quickly to abolish slavery. Well, Horace Greeley, of course, was an abolitionist, and Horace Greeley is a great figure in American history. But one of the things that Horace Greeley was not was a politician. Why wasn't he a politician? Because Horace Greeley did not understand that basic definition as Lincoln did. He did not know what the art of the possible is, whereas Lincoln did know it. So Lincoln reads the editorial in the... In the uh, the editorial is August 19th, 1862. He reads the editorial, and he writes this letter to, uh, to Horace Greeley. 
Uh, Honorable Horace Greeley, dear sir, I have just read yours of the 19th addressed to myself through the New York Tribune. Now this next paragraph is a very lawyerly paragraph. So uh, if there are any lawyers here that uh, I'm sure they'll recognize it. If there be in it any statements or assumptions of fact which I may know to be erroneous, I do not now and here controvert them. If there be in it any inferences which I may believe to be falsely drawn, I do not now and here argue against them. If there be uh, perceptible <coughs> in it an impatient and dictatorial tone, I wave it in deference to an old friend whose heart I have always supposed to be right. As to the policy I, and here he quotes, seem to be pursuing, as you say, I have not meant to leave anyone in doubt. I would save the Union. You know, very short sentence, right to the point. I would save the Union. I would save it the shortest way under the Constitution. The sooner the national authority can be restored, the nearer the Union will be the Union as it was. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps save the Union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause, and I shall do more whenever I shall believe doing more will help the cause. I shall try to correct errors when shown to be errors, and I shall adopt new views as fast as they shall appear to be true views. And, then, and, then, and this is what he says in his concluding paragraph. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty. Now here's a guy who's in this role and he, he is such an intelligent guy, but he understands that he's the president of the United States. And he separates his views of the world as the president from his views of the world as Abraham Lincoln. And he concludes, and I intend no modification of my oft expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. But he's, what he's telling you is the Constitution, uh, as he reads it, said it's okay for the Southerners to have slavery. But as he also as he reads it, it's, all, it's not okay for them to spread slavery to the rest of, of uh, North America. And so I offer you this letter, as, as I read it in, in, in uh, Kearns Goodwin's book here, to illustrate the idea that the guy as a politician is really uh, amazing. I mean, he, he knows how to practice the art of the possible. Lincoln, a much better politician than Horace Greeley, always seemed to have a much better grasp of what was possible in the political arena than anyone else around him, certainly better than Greeley, whose repeated failures as a politician throughout his life testify to that. Greeley was uh, you know, a great uh, a publisher and editor of a newspaper, but uh, he never, never succeeded as a politician. Now the third thing about Lincoln, besides <laughs> the two things I've mentioned already. Third, Lincoln's character was unique. Not only was he a smart man, all of the rivals in this book were smart men. I think all of them would have been in the honors classes and gotten all sorts of academic uh, accolades. Seward, Chase, Stanton, Bass, all highly capable, articulate men. Uh, but what Lincoln possessed to a remarkable degree was a sense of perspective a point of view toward other people which enabled him to work with others and especially to employ the talents of others in a great national cause. I, I think that the point that she gets at in this book is, but here's this guy, he's a human being just like the rest of us are. 
But the rest of us could not have tolerated the sorts of things that he tolerated from the people around him. And, and, and because he had a point of view that said, well, here I am, I'm the president, and I got to make this work. And I assemble this group of people, and they're all very talented. And just because I don't like them, or because they annoy me by the things they do, I'm not going to fire them. And there are many examples of that in this book. I am going to treat them in a way where their talents will be put to work for the benefit of this great country that I am trying to, to lead through this terrible uh, problematic time. And, and I, I think that's the thing that's really unique about him. I don't think anybody else, certainly not either Seward or Chase, could have done what he did under these circumstances. And I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, well, Lincoln possessed to a remarkable degree was a sense of perspective, a point of view toward other people, which enabled him to work with other people, and especially to employ the talents of others in a great national cause in a way that very likely no one else could have done. He could overlook the insulting behavior of McClellan. I've got to tell you, when you read this book, to me, McClellan comes through as a, as a guy that, I don't, I, you know, the president calls you up, you're, the, you're a general, the president calls you up and says, I'm coming down to talk to you about something, and you just say, well, uh, I, I won't be able to meet you for an hour or so, you know, because I'm taking a nap or something else. Uh, it, it, it struck me as, as Kearns Goodwin presented, I thought, gee, this is outrageous for this guy to behave the way he, he uh, does. Uh, the insulting behavior of McClellan of Chase, and uh, yes, of Seward as well, and the problems caused by Montgomery Blair and deal with them in the way that benefited the nation. He put the country's interest above his own personal inclinations over and over again. A notable example of this unique quality in Lincoln's personality is revealed in his first race for a U.S. Senate seat in Illinois in 1854. And uh, by your leave, I'll read this aloud to you. Now, what happens here is, uh, just to give you a little bit of a quick background, when people ran for U.S. Senate in the, in the 19th century, you know, the senators were not elected by a popular vote. They were, they were chosen by a state legislature. That was true in New York. It was true all over the, the country, but this was what was happening in Illinois. So Lincoln wants to be a senator. Uh, and without prolonging this any longer, he realizes that in order to become a senator, in the, he has to get 51 votes in the, in the state legislature of Illinois. Uh, to reach a majority of 51 votes, Lincoln would have to hold together the fragile coalition comprised of former rivals in the Whig and Democratic camps who had only recently joined hands against the Nebraska bill. The issue here is the Kansas-Nebraska Act. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but that was a law that was sponsored especially by Stephen Douglas. And what, basically what it, what it said was, let the people in the territories choose their own uh, solution to this problem of slavery. They can, they can go to get together and they can vote whether they want to be a slave state or a free state. Remember that was a, a different direction than the one taken by the Missouri Compromise in 1820. Because the Missouri Compromise said that, uh, you know, north of a certain line, uh, there, there would be no more slave states. Well, anyway, these folks are against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. That, that is what Lincoln's trying to do is to make sure that slavery does not spread any further than it has already spread in the western part of the United States. Led by the governor, the senators marched into the House chamber at the appointed hour. When all was, were sworn and the balloting began, on the first ballot, Lincoln received 45 votes. So he's six votes short of winning. Against 41 for the Douglas Democrat, James Shields, and five for Congressman Lyman Trumbull. The five anti-Nebraska Democrats who voted for Trumbull were led by Norman Judd of Chicago. 
They had no personal animosity toward Lincoln, but having been elected as Democrats, they could not sustain themselves at home, they claimed, if they were to vote for a Whig for a senator. Remember Lincoln was a Whig? We get into all sorts of stuff here, don't we? And the Whigs, of course, later became Republicans. Uh, uh, if the ballots were fo that fo in the ballots that followed, as daylight gave way to gaslight in the Great Hall, Lincoln reached a high point of 47 votes, only four shy of victory. Nevertheless, the Little Trumbull co Coalition refused to budge, denying Lincoln the necessary majority. Finally, after nine ballots, Lincoln concluded that unless his supporters shifted to Trumbull, the Douglas Democrats, who had, as expected, switched their allegiance to Madison, would soon choose the next senator. So Lincoln's perception is that even though he has all these votes, the cause that he's interested in supporting is going to lose unless he changes. So what does he do? He takes his 47 votes and gives them to Trumbull. So here's the guy with four votes. Lincoln turns around and gives him 47 votes. Trumbull is elected senator. Now, what he does after that, to me, is the really amazing thing. He shows up at the party that Trumbull is having for his victory, and he congratulates Trumbull. Can you believe that? He congratulates Trumbull. The guy who had four votes and wouldn't give up his four votes forced the guy who had 47 votes to give his up, and Lincoln goes in and congratulates him. Uh, when Logan rose to speak, the tension in the chamber was so great that the spectators scarcely breathed. Uh, in a sad voice, he announced that it was the purpose of the remaining Whigs to decide the contest. Obeying his directions, Lincoln supporters switched their votes to Trumbull, giving him the 51 votes needed for victory. Lincoln's friends were inconsolable, believing that this was perhaps his last chance for that high position. Logan put his hands over his face and began to cry, while Davis stormily announced that had he been Lincoln in Lincoln's situation, he never would have consented to the 47 men being controlled by the five. In public, Lincoln expressed no hard feelings toward either Trumbull or Judd. He, he deliberately showed up at Trumbull's victory party with a smile on his face and a warm handshake for the victor. Consoled that the Nebraska men were worse whipped than he, Lincoln insisted that Madison's defeat gives me more pleasure than my own uh, gives me pain. On the whole, it is perhaps as well for our general cause that Trumbull is elected. Lincoln's magnanimity served him well. While Seward and Chase would lose friends in victory, Seward by neglecting at the height of his success his old friend Horace Greeley and Chase by not understanding the lingering resentments that followed in the wake of his 1849 Senate victory, Lincoln in defeat gained friends. Uh, <clears throat> neither Trumbull nor Judd would ever forget Lincoln's generous behavior. Indeed, both men would assist him in his bid for the U.S. Senate in 1858, and Judd would play a critical role in his run for the presidency in 1860. So by his lack of egotism, Lincoln converted these guys to his side, which is something that neither Seward nor Chase could have done, particularly Chase. But then listen to this next paragraph, because I think the next paragraph would depict where most of us would fit into the picture here. Mary Lincoln was unable to be so gracious. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think most of them are more of us like Mary than we are like Abe, you know. Uh, convinced that Trumbull had acted with cold and selfish treachery, she never spoke another word to Trumbull's wife, Ju Julia, who had been a bridesmaid at her wedding and one of her closest friends. <coughs> Through intermediaries, uh, though intermediaries, intermediaries tried to, in succeeding years to bring the two women together, the ruptured friendship never healed. But... Uh, this is the sort of, I, I mentioned this one example because it seems to me to be so, uh, you know, so uh, outstanding. But this is the kind of thing that Lincoln did as she depicts him in this book over and over again. For example, 
William Henry Seward, Union College, class of 1820. <coughs> I'm happy to say I'm Union College, class of 1950. <laughs> <A little. laughs> well, William Henry Seward, uh, described as feisty, for instance, when, when, when he graduated from college in 1820, uh, in his biography, he told one of his friends, he said, you know, uh, I tell you what, I'm not going to show up for graduation unless they make me valedictorian of the class because I'm smarter than all the, these other guys and I'm not going <laughs> to sit there and listen to some guy talk that I don't think is as smart as I am. <laughs> uh, well, he was the valedictorian of the class and he was chosen to be the class speaker. But, but Lincoln, uh, you know, asked him to become the Secretary of State. You know, Seward won the first two ballots in 1860. He didn't have enough votes to be nominated president by the Republicans, but he won the first two. So he, uh, uh, you know, he, he, uh, his expectations were shattered. He was sitting at home in Auburn waiting to be, you know, to hear that he was president. He'd been a, a, a assured by uh, uh, Thurlow Weed that he was going to win, and he lost, and it was a terrible blow for him. But Lincoln offered to make him Secretary of State, and he accepted. Well, first of all, he accepted with the idea that he and Thurlow Weed were then going to choose the cabinet. Uh, there were all going to be guys who would get along with Seward. Well, Lincoln had to tell him, no, that was not the case. He was going to choose the cabinet. Then after Lincoln was inaugurated, they used to inaugurate the president in March. Now they do it in January, of course. But after Lincoln was inaugurated, Seward went to... Uh, uh, you know, that started working on the cabinet, and, and after a month, this was supposed, was supposed to have happened on April the 1st in 1861, uh, but after a month, Seward decided that Lincoln wasn't doing a very good job, so he put together this proposition, in which essentially what he suggested to Lincoln was that the way the government should be run is that Lincoln should accept the role of being a figurehead in the government, while he, Seward, the Secretary of State, <laughs> would be the prime minister, and he would run the show. And he gave this to Lincoln, and Lincoln looked it over and uh, said, no, that's not the way it's going to be. <laughs> I'm the guy who's in charge. But the remarkable thing is that Lincoln did not get angry with Seward. He didn't fire him. You know, he didn't do anything like that. He didn't criticize him. He just went with the flow. Eventually, it turned out that these two men had the closest relationship of, of all the people who surrounded Lincoln. And Seward became a great admirer of Lincoln's. Uh, now, there were repeated instances of this kind that, are, that Doris Kern Goodwin presents in this book. And the point I'm trying to make is that Lincoln's greatest attribute, and he had a lot of great attributes. He was a very bright man. He was as bright as any of these guys that he chose to be with him. And they were all very bright men. But he, and, and he, it's interesting, just as an incidental thing, was also quite a good athlete. You know, repeatedly she gives examples of situations where he does stuff uh, that were very athletic things. I mean, he didn't have the kind of athletic stuff going on that we do today, but you know, he was a great wrestler. And uh, she describes situations where they visited battlefields during the book and they had to go through some very hazardous situations. And Stanton, Stanton was another guy that Lincoln forgave for not treating him well. Uh, but Stanton, uh, Stanton had, a, had the same problem I have, frankly. He doesn't like heights. He you know, doesn't like to look down long distances. And he would get dizzy and, and have a lot of trouble you know, crossing these bridges and doing stuff like that. Lincoln never had that problem. When I read that in this book, I thought to myself, this is just like when I was a kid, you know. Let's go over the creek and we'll cross on the dam and all that kind of stuff. And all these guys I was with never seemed to have any trouble or I was frightened out of my mind. Uh, what, but Lincoln never, so, you know, he had all this talent of, of so many different kinds that he could employ in, and it did employ in the service of the country, as I said. Uh, <coughs> Now, just as the title of the last chapter, here the subject is Lincoln's decision to put together a cabinet genuinely representing the diversity of the Republican Party at this time. Now, remember, the Republican Party had just come into existence in 1854. And before that, it had been the Whig Party. And the cabinet that he was putting together consisted mainly of men 
who were united in their, in their attitude of opposition toward the spread of slavery. So there were Democrats as well as former Whigs, as well as, as Republicans. So there's a great variety of people. He is not trying to make himself comfortable. He is trying to serve what he perceives as the best interests of the country. He gets into negotiations with all the people involved, how he approached them, what he said, what they said. Then the country begins to, uh, then as he's, he's putting the cabinet together, the country starts uh, to uh, disintegrate. The southern states pull out, and then he gets into Seward's role in the Senate. Seward was the, like the leading guy speaking on behalf of the Republican Party in the Senate until Lincoln was inaugurated. Seward's efforts to conciliate with Southerners actually did him a lot of political harm because the, the people who, were, who saw Seward as a, uh, an abolitionist were really quite disappointed that he went so, as far as he did in trying to conciliate with the South. But Seward was doing really what Lincoln thought should be done, that was to try and save the Union. Uh, but Seward's efforts at conciliation failed. Uh, <clears throat> individuals managed to persuade him to accept the roles he wanted them. He, he persuaded all these guys to accept the roles he wanted them to accept. There's a great comment on Seward and Weed who felt they should have had a hand in putting together a cabinet to make Seward comfortable. But Lincoln said no, that was his job. Sort of a gradual process of discovering Lincoln's greatness. Intellectually, humanly, and I think especially morally, he seemed to be able to resist his own egotism and always come down on the side of doing what was right. Doris Kearns Goodwin provides us with biographical sketches not only of the rivals, who are Seward, Chase, and Bates, but also with other members of the cabinet, particularly Gideon Wells and Montgomery Blair, and most importantly, Edward Stanton. As she perceives what happened in his relationships with each of these men, Lincoln won each of them over so that except for Chase, each of them became a genuine admirer of his as a result of the way he treated them and of the way they observed he conducted himself. The book ends on the sad note of the assassination of Lincoln and the brutal attempt to uh, assassinate Seward. Doris Kearns Goodwin follows this account with a brief summary of what happened to each of the main characters in this history, which, considering the way they all wound up, is both interesting and often very, very sad. Uh, now, the, uh, uh, the guy that, that, uh, that I think gave Lincoln the hardest time as far as his cabinet was concerned was Chase. But Chase was a brilliant man. And Lincoln recognized Chase's gifts. And he, I think Lincoln felt that he needed a guy like Chase to be, the, you know, to run the financial affairs of the country during a very perilous time. Now Chase resigned three times. And three times Lincoln talked him out of leaving the cabinet. Then he resigned a fourth time. And the fourth time Chase resigned, Lincoln surprised Chase by accepting his resignation, <laughs> which kind of uh, took Chase aback. And, but, but then, you know, to follow through on this, and, and again, it's, it's another example of Lincoln's lack of egotism. I mean, I, I think most of us in, in, in this kind of relationship that Lincoln had with Chase, most of us would have said, goodbye, brother. Don't darken my door again. But what did Lincoln do? Lincoln made Chase the, the uh, uh, chairman of the uh, Supreme Court, the, the chief justice of the Supreme Court. And Lincoln had an opportunity to make Montgomery Blair the chief justice of the Supreme Court. And from what I read in the book, I get the feeling that on a personal level, Lincoln's relationship with Blair, who was the, uh, uh, the Postmaster General and who did an outstanding job as Postmaster General during the Civil War, uh, and it, for the country, just reorganizing the Postal Service and making it much better. But Lincoln looked at both of these guys and decided that Chase would be a better Chief Justice than uh, Blair. And again, an example of how he uh, brilliantly, it seems to me, served the interests of the country. 
in spite of the fact that, you know, most of us could understand if Lincoln said, no, I don't want anything to do with this guy. He's just an egotistical so-and-so, and he's always given me a hard time, and I'm glad to get rid of him, which is the way I probably would have reacted. Uh, but uh, but he not, that's not what he did. He said he's the most capable guy there is in the government for this particular role, and he's the guy I'm going to give it to. Again, an example of Lincoln's. Chase's uh, daughter uh, was, uh, was like the, uh, uh, the rival of Mary Todd Lincoln in the sense that she, uh, she was a beautiful girl and an uh, outstanding social leader, and she came to such a sad end. You read these stories about these people, my God, it just is, is so gripping to uh, hear about this. She, she wound up marrying a guy, from a senator from Rhode Island, whose name was Sprague, who was a very wealthy guy and who uh, uh, had a textile business up there. Was very, very, and it was, it was a United States senator as well. And then it turns out that Mr. Sprague had a, a drinking problem. And, and the two of them did not get along very well together. And their marriage eventually broke up. But it, it broke up after uh, uh, Kate Sprague, or Kate Chase Sprague, got involved with a fellow by the name of Roscoe Conkling. Do you know who Roscoe Conkling is? Utica. Utica, Utica. right. <laughs> Utica. Roscoe Conkling was, a, was a, 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 a New York State senator from the city of uh, Utica, and a very powerful and influential guy. And Roscoe and Kate uh, 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 Chase Sprague were apparently having an affair, and uh, they were discovered by her husband, and oh, it was a, a terrible mess. And then poor Kate winds up living in Washington in what was her, the, the home she formerly occupied with her father and dying at a relatively early age of a, of a very debilitating disease uh, at a time when she was taking care of one of her children who turned out to, have a, uh, to be a, a handicapped child. So it, it really made, you feel, made me feel very sad to read about her end that way. Now Lincoln's relationship with Seward was the, the closest of anybody in the cabinet, and uh, there are repeated mentions of, uh, of the fact that, Seward, that Lincoln spent a lot of time at Seward's uh, home, visiting with Seward because he enjoyed Seward's uh, company. Now what happened uh, on, the, on the occasion uh, when uh, Lincoln was assassinated was that the, the plot was to assassinate Lincoln uh, and the Vice President Johnson and Seward. And as it turned out, Seward had been out uh, on a ride with, uh, uh, with his, uh, I think with his daughter, and uh, maybe with, her, with uh, another person. But anyway, the, the horse got spooked and ran away. And Seward was uh, uh, an older guy now, you know. Uh, this, is, he's, uh, this is 1865, so he's 65 years old. And he tries to jump out of the carriage to control the horses, and his heel gets caught in one of those things on the, underneath the door, and he falls on the ground, and he's really quite seriously injured. And he winds up uh, in the Seward household, uh, you know, all bound up and uh, fortunately still alive, recovering from his injuries. But at the same time that Lincoln is being assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, uh, the, uh, uh, Lewis Powell, another one of the conspirators, goes to Seward's house uh, claims that he's there from a pharmacy bringing some medicine in, and uh, he's, go he's trying to murder Seward. Now, he, he, uh, it's a very dramatic uh, confrontation. He, he, uh, he assaults uh, one of Lincoln's sons, fractures his skull by striking him on the head with a pistol. Fortunately, the pistol did not go off. So, and, and the son, uh, another Union graduate, Frederick Seward, graduate. <laughs> The son eventually recovers from his injuries, but he breaks into Seward's room, and he has a, uh, a, a Bowie knife with him, and he attempts to assassinate Seward. 
Now here's the irony of it. Seward is all bound up and he has these iron, this iron thing on which is supporting his jaw because his jaw was broken in the accident. And when the guy strikes out at him with his knife, the, the iron contraption that he has on his head diverts the knife. So even though he is badly wounded and, and bleeds a lot, he is not, he's not killed. And, and Lewis Powell runs away. Uh, well, eventually, of course, uh, all these folks are caught up with, and you know, of course, what happened to John Wilkes Booth. Incidentally, the, the, uh, the couple who was with Lincoln at that night, that was uh, Ira, Harris's, Ira Harris, resident of Colony, Ira Harris's daughter, uh, and her husband, Ira Harris's stepson, uh, were with Lincoln at the time that Lincoln was uh, assassinated. And Thurlow Weed, who played such an important part in, in Seward's life and in the Republican Party and in the Whig Party before that, uh, is uh, another guy who lived here in Albany, published an Albany newspaper, is buried at the Albany Rural Cemetery. I think I've gone about as far as I ought to go. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try and answer them. Uh, Yes. Does the book read like a history book or like a historical novel? Because I just finished the biography and it was as dry as dust. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, it's you know, it's a lengthy book, but I, I but to me, it read it read more like a, a, a historical in the sense, as I said at the outset, like a novel, in the sense that. Uh, I think that her, because of her research, she's uncovered so many things about these people that we would not otherwise know. When you get into this stuff, well, just I still feel irritation over reading about McClellan, for example, <laughs> and, and McClellan's treatment of, of Lincoln and McClellan's treatment of other people now. Well, we're referring to with Truman, right? <laughs> right. Yes. I had a couple of comments I wanted to offer along some of the themes that you mentioned sure. concerning Lincoln's ability to appreciate the uh, opinion of other people and the feelings of other people and not allow his own uh, being upset to cloud his judgment. Uh, one, the way he reacted with uh, General Fremont making right. his declaration earlier in the war because he was trying to keep together the coalition of uh, the borderline states that hadn't seceded but that were holding slaves. Second, uh, the indignities visited upon him by family life in terms of Mary's outburst on occasion, right. which he absorbed very quietly. Uh, the other thing that I was really uh, amazed by, and I don't recall exactly where it was in the book, but his own analytical way of breaking down the political process kind of foreshadowed urban machine politics of you know laying out a number of voters, laying out which ones are strongly in your camp, and therefore you know you don't really have to use any resources with them, and then going after the ones in the middle that haven't made up their mind and aren't strongly against you either. Um, well, that that was really yeah, that was a marked difference between him and a guy like Chase, for example, because Lincoln apparently ran his own campaigns, you know, with the assistance of these guys whom he had won over in Illinois. But as you're right, I mean, apparently he, he had a, a, a very good sense of, of again, of politics is the art of the possible. He knew what he had to do in order to gain the success that he was uh, uh, looking for. Uh, and all, all these fellows shared something in common, which I, uh, uh, which I, I, I got to admit, in, in reading this book, I, I keep being reminded of my wife's aunt, Anna, whose uh, husband, Tom Renee, was the city engineer for the uh, city of Troy for many, many years. And she said, she always said something about, whenever we went to visit her, she'd say, her, one of her favorite phrases was, he is really somebody, or you are really somebody. And I, I read this book and I thought, well, all these guys were interested, they shared in one thing, they all wanted to be somebody. That is to say, they wanted to occupy a place in the community where people would recognize their their talents and, and grant them the kind of respect which they uh, they really yearn for. Uh, as to uh, the other comment that you made about uh, 
uh, what, what was it again? Uh, 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 Mary's outburst. Yeah, Mary's outburst. That was tough for him. Also, the fact that his wife was apparently uh, not, uh, Mary was not a person. She wanted to decorate the White House. She didn't really have the money to do it, but she, that didn't stop her. <laughs> so what she did, without his knowing it, was she plunged him into debt, which was very embarrassing for him because he wasn't really that kind of guy. It's amazing when you read about that relationship that they had with each other, how, how they managed to, to live through it as well as they did. Yes, sir. With a degree in American history, I'm amazed at what I didn't know and that I, what I found out, especially Bates. I knew next to nothing about Bates. I, I didn't even realize he was a player. And speaking of players, purely a subjective decision on my part, Lincoln played these guys. Lincoln, he knew what buttons to push and what buttons not to push, and he played these guys. He played Chase against Seward. And he knew Stanton was excitable. That's an understatement. <laughs> but, and he knew how to, to, to use them. He used them for the goal. He never lost sight of the goal, which was to save the Union. And he played these guys like violins. Well, I, I agree with you. I think he did. I, I don't know that he, that he was uh, like a cynical player. But no, 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 no. By no means. I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. say Machiavellian but he, or anything but yeah, like that. But, but, but he, he knew what he was doing. Right. Well, do you remember the scene in here, which is described in this book, where, where uh, it happened, I think it was the end of uh, 1862, when the Chase was manipulating uh, senators, trying to, to get Seward ousted right. from the cabinet, right, right, and the way Lincoln handled that whole thing, right. and when Chase right. gave him the resignation, <laughs> and then he he takes it away right. from him, but he keeps it, right, and he almost like holds it like an ace of trumps, <laughs> and he holds on to it, yes. and now he has Chase's resignation and he has Seward's resignation, and he keeps them. And he knows that he has them, and he gets ready to, I go back to the same phrase, when to play it. Right. When well, I think your, your observation is a very good one, but that's a great example of what you're talking about, that he, that he, that he handled that in the way that he did. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, between the book, 1776, and this book, I wonder how we ever became the country that we <laughs> Well, <laughs> but certainly it's a challenge. <laughs> Well, I, I think I think it's a challenge in terms of our own of our own humanity, and, and you know uh, that's why I I really feel like the most heroic thing about Lincoln was the fact that he could overlook uh, that that he was you know that, that business of his being willing to give up the Senate seat. I don't know that there's anyone else that could have. Uh, that could have done that. But you know, it was funny because McClellan stuck in my mind too because as much as I've read on the Civil War, it was from letters that he, that Goodwin began to realize that what he, McClellan said was written to his wife. Right, right. And what was said behind the back that I think nobody else ever got to. No. No, I, I don't. I think there's. That's one of the great things about this particular book is I think there's a lot of stuff in it that is. Uh, you ask the question about whether it's a novel. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in it that no one else has ever uncovered to the degree that Doris Kearns Goodwin did. So that that's one of the things that makes it so interesting. Yes. And now that the war yes. was over and the Union preserved, right? And uh, we know how he felt with malice toward no. no right reaching out a hand to the South. How do you think he would have handled Reconstruction? I could question the hate that he's a good person to say that he would have to face. Well, I've got to tell you, uh, I'm reminded of something that, uh, that uh, uh, Joe Doty, uh, Professor Joseph Doty, who was a teacher I had in college, uh, once said, with respect to questions like that, he said, uh, you cannot tell what would have happened if what had happened hadn't happened. <laughs> That's my defense. Well, I guess we sort of cherish the idea that, that he would have done a better job of, of, of maintaining the country than, than was done. And perhaps he would have done a better job of, uh, on, on behalf of the, of the freed slaves 
than, uh, than others did, uh, you know, who were in positions of power uh, after that time. At least you'd like to think so. I don't know how it would have come out, but he was uh, a man who had this terrific capacity <coughs> For as, as several people have pointed out, for point, you know, uh, well you, you call it, you know, the manipulation of other people, but he knew how to treat people so that he could get them to do what was right. It's interesting. I, I think I mentioned this to you before that Frederick Douglass, who went to visit Lincoln, um, uh, Frederick Douglass comes out of a situation where he talks to a lot of abolitionists, and yet Lincoln is not an abolitionist. But Frederick Douglass makes the comment that he was more comfortable in Lincoln's presence as a, you know, a fellow human being, without respect to the difference in color, than he was in the presence of, of these folks that from Massachusetts, whose names do not occur to me at this moment, who were abolitionists and were very strident in their effort to uh, to get slavery abolished because they felt it was a great moral evil. And I think Lincoln felt it was great moral evil too, but he also felt that the Constitution. Incidentally, you know, as in that letter that he wrote to uh, to uh, Greeley, you know, he said if I could free some of the slaves and not others, I would do it. Well, that's what happened with the Emancipation Proclamation. When the Emancipation Proclamation was announced, <coughs> the slaves in the South who had rebelled against the Union were free, but the slaves in the border states were not free. They weren't free until after the, you know, until after the uh, the Constitution was amended. Yes. Um, thinking of uh, current history, which is unfolding now, does the book mention the uh, small splinter group who, in 19 or 1862, was interested in impeaching uh, President Lincoln for exceeding his uh, congressional? Uh, uh, or his constitutional authority, perhaps? You know, I don't recall that. Yeah. No. No. I, don't, I, I didn't know that there was a small splinter group. <coughs> I have read about that. It's about the size of the, the current splinter group yeah. who was uh, interested in the same thing. <laughs> right. No, I don't remember that reading that. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't remember hearing about it so, any place else, to be honest with you. Well, folks, I guess this concludes our get together today. Thank you all very much. There's some flyers in the back. Um, we'll see everyone next month. Next month, we're doing a book called Social Intelligence by um, Dana Bowman. The month after Heat by Bill Buford. I think we'll have some interesting reviewers. So. Please come back. Thanks. We'll frankly back again, too.